Yeah, thanks. So first, I want to thank the conference organizer for putting together this uh, great conference. Um, today, I'll talk about the grid-based simulations for misaligned disks and disk breaking. Um, so this image you have seen, you are seeing here, is very similar to all the certain binary disk simulations you have seen so far, it looks like. But it actually has a very different setup. The binaries at the center is actually moving in and out of the screen. Um, so this is a polar aligned certain binary disks. I'll talk about this more uh, later. Um, so over the past several days, uh, it's very interesting to hear research from the binary black hole community and to learn about their research. And uh, it seems there is a lot of sim there are a lot of similarities um, between the black hole binary black hole community and the planet disk interaction community. Not only regarding the science, but also regarding the ways of thinking or the ways to attack the problem. So for theorists um, who have carried out very nice simulations and they are interested in how these uh, binary orbits will change. Um, but for observers, they are interested in how to use the emissions coming from these regions to probe like uh, binary black holes at the center. So on my notebook, I wrote that you could use double peak line AGN, uh, recoil variability or spiky. So all of these coming from the regions around the binary. So in the planet disk interaction community, um, over decades, people have studied planet disk interaction and the focus is on planet migration. Only over the last decades, largely thanks to AMA, we start to think about how planets could induce disk features, our focus start to shift toward disks and start to use the disk features like gaps, spirals, or kinematics, or even these mini disk circumplanetary disk to probe planets. Okay. So um, we have these beautiful AMA images with a lot of gaps and rings. And nowadays we could build complicated models trying to reproduce these observations. Um, so in this case, we could have a single planet, 100 AU, set a mass, reproduce all the gaps and rings in this single system. And uh, with this, uh, we could even probe a potential young planet population. And hopefully in future, uh, we could compare these young planet populations with these uh, mature planet population, exoplanet population to understand planet evolution and planet migration. Okay. So while we are working on these detailed comparison, we also have many surprises. Uh, one of the surprises come from these transitional disks. These are disks with very large cavities um, and holes. So if you think these cavity and holes are produced by giant planets or binary, then that means we have a lot of surprises coming from certain binary disks. Um, so I'll give you three examples on what are these surprises. So the first one is HD142527 is a circum binary disk. And uh, it has 100 AU cavity, very large cavity. By the center, um, it has a low mass companion, only 13 AU away from the star. So in this case, this companion seems to induce this very wide um, gap or cavity. And you have seen these spirals and these spirals could be due to this binary uh, interaction. But what's surprising thing here is that you see these two dark regions in the disks. And this dark region is due to a misaligned inner disks. Um, so at the nodal position, the inner disk will block the starlight and cast shadows to the outer circum binary disk. And by studying the position of this shadow, and the width of this shadow, you will be able to constrain the inner disk's geometry um, and inclination. So in this case, the inner disk is a 10 AU disk and a 70 degree misaligned from the circumbinary disk. So it's a heavily misaligned system. And if you assume that this binary causes this um, misaligned inner disks, you can run a simulation and use a highly inclined eccentric binary, kind of torque the disks, and the cast shadow to the outer part of the disk. So nevertheless, in this circum binary disk system, you have a heavily, heavily misaligned binary and the outer disk. Okay. So this is one case that we have seen some broken disks uh, for circum binary systems. Um, the, another example is HD100453. 
three. In this case, again, you have a low mass com companion uh, around another star, and you have a nice uh, circum primary disk. So this is a mini disk. If you think about this, is a mini disk around uh, one star. And uh, you see these spirals, um, but that's not the surprising thing because if you are from the galactic community, you know the uh, whirlpool galaxy. You could have a satellite induce these spirals. So this is not surprising for the spirals. We could reproduce them. What's surprising is that for this circum primary disk, this mini disk, it also has a shadow. And if you trying to feed these shadows, you will get a 70 degree misaligned inner disks within this circum primary disk, which cast a shadow. So in this case, you have a broken disk around the circum primary disk. So could there be another companion uh, in this circum primary disk to break the disk? Or both of these uh, misaligned disks are due to the companion far away? We don't know. So this is another interesting puzzling thing um, for regarding binary systems. So things get even more strange for some systems where we don't have any companion or no any companion. So this is one HD 14306. It has a wide gap. And if you look at CO kinematics, the disk seems to be twisted at the center. Um, but if you look at near infrared scatter light, you have this strange um, image, like left side is bright, right side is dark but then there is a ring here is bright. And this can be reproduced by a 30 degree misaligned inner disk. So in this case, the left side is illuminated by the central star directly. So, so you can see this bright part. But on the right side, the outer disk is blocked by this, this disk, the center disk we, we cannot see. But at the edge of this disk, is illuminated by the back side of the star. Uh, the star sh shining through the back side of the primary disk um, of this uh, the small disk, and you can see this bright rim here. Okay. So you could use a 30 degree misaligned disk to reproduce all the features observed here. Uh, so you put a very stringent constraint on the disk size, disk geometry uh, for misaligned uh, system. So you may say, okay, so I'm cherry picking three examples just to demonstrate that this can be broken. Um, but if you look at the bigger sample, this is a very recent work by using VOTI gravity to image the inner disks at the 0.5 AU scale and compare with AMA uh, for the outer disk at 100 AU scale. And you can see that a lot of cases, uh, there are five cases firmly showing that these two disks, inner disks and outer disks are misaligned. And also there are five cases showing that they are um, aligned. So at least it seems that you have an equal po possibility for transitional disks, these disks with big cavities and gaps, be aligned or be misaligned. Okay. So, so it seems that um, for a lot of disks, uh, we need to think about why these disks are separated into two parts and why they are misaligned um, in a lot of cases, these are seems to be ubiquitous. So there are even um, these examples where you have these shadows and these shadows are actually changes with time. So it's not very regularly changing. You can see here is a dark um, shadow and this shadow sometimes disappear and uh, appear um, and it's moving. It's, uh, it's very chaotic in some cases. Um, so, so um, in my talk, I'll talk about some theoretical aspects on how to break a disk, um, make this to work. The first is how to break a disk with a low mass companion. What kind of a planet mass you need to break a disk. Um, then I'll talk about how to break a disk by the central star, um, the central star's talk. Finally, some thoughts on simulation setup, since this is a simulation section. So the easiest way to break a disk is that you have a low mass companion and this low mass companion open a gap. And whenever you open a gap, you stop the communication between the inner and outer disk. Then both of the disks just persist by itself. Um, so after a while, the inner disk persists and you have a misalignment. Okay. So this kind of a misaligned planets have been uh, studied a lot, um, but peer, most previous work are focused on the evolution of the planet instead of the disk's response to the planet. 
And there is a very limited amount of work on the disk response to the planet. And most of them are, actually all of them are SPH simulations. And all the simulations find that the um, giant planets cannot break the disk. They will warp the disks, but the inner and outer disks are still connected. Uh, they are still processed at one frequency. Um, but in polar boundaries, we know the viscosity could be very low, um, could be less than 10 to negative three. So that motivates us to study this problem using a grid-based code. Um, so we carry out Athena++ plus plus simulation. Uh, in this simulation, we have a misaligned planets in the disks, but the planet here, oh, the, this is the planet. The planet here is that the, the grid mid plane. This is angular momentum vector and we misalign the disk initially so that the disk will process along the angular momentum vector of the binary, or here is a low mass companion. So we use mesh refinement so that we have a high resolution around the disks and we run for hundreds of orbits so that um, we could see the disk breaking and the misalignment. Okay. So uh, first we need to talk about code test or um, convergence. Um, so the first thing we need to make sure that we, the code is doing something right is that we need to see the, whether the disk process at the right frequency, right? Uh, we are using the grid code to do something not normally uh, have been done. So in this case, we have this uh, binary star, Lumas star, and we have a mini disk around one star. And just to look at running the simulation, whether the disk will uh, persist. Uh, in this case, the disk process at the right frequency. And then we could do a numerical resolution study uh, with different number of grid per scale height. And you see that no matter what we do, it seems the surface density profile looks similar, um, but the disk warp is actually different about the twist. If you lose too low resolution, the disk process um, too, too slow, which is this red solid uh, curve here compared with all the other higher resolution or lower uh, re, um, numerical resistivity cases, this case is processed too slow. So now we know what's the numerical requirement we need to get the precision right. Uh, so we'll drop 10 grid per scale height. And then we have this, uh, we could carry out this full disk simulation with a planet uh, in the disks. So here we have a 90 degree misaligned 10 Jupiter mass planet and in the alpha 0.01 disks, um, so this is like the planet, the companion star mass ratio is one over 100. Okay, you could convert this to black hole um, cases. Um, so in this simulation, um, the planet is torquing the inner disks, but the inner disk is still connected with the outer disk. So the disk never break, the disk stuck uh, here. But if we just decrease the viscosity by a factor of 10, uh, and then you can see that the planets start to open a very deep gap. And then these two disks break, the inner disks start to persist um, by itself. Okay. okay. So apparently the breaking of the disk is related to the gap opening process. Um, the deeper gap you get is easier um, to break. So we try to work out this analytical criterion for gap, uh, for disk breaking. And uh, there are two steps to do. The first is calculate how the gap depth related with the planet mass. Um, so we derive this and uh, consistent with simulation, simulation consistent with an NQ results. And then you calculate um, how the torque could um, pass through this gap. Um, and if you combine all, all these, uh, you will get the breaking condition. This is the minimum mass of a companion to break a disk and how it is related with disk alpha um, disk scale height. Right. So if you are studying binary black holes, you can put your mass ratio, your quantities here to see whether the, the black hole could break the disk. Right. So for polar planet disks um, conditions, um, we say that even in a low alpha or thin disks, um, a planet with Jupiter mass is still needed to break the disk. So it's not that easy to break a disk by a um, companion. This may explain why we only see shadows in some of these very large cavity disks. These large cavity disks requires you have a massive companion and that companion uh, will, uh, could break the disks. And also the disks with the shadows are also the prime targets for searching exoplanets uh, because you could have a massive companion in the disk. Okay. So here 
we talk about the breaking, and we could generate observational signatures of these uh, misaligned disks. Uh, this is a post-processing with the Monte Carlo radio transfer calculation, and you see the shadows cast by the inner disks here. Uh, and when you have this gap edge vortex, uh, similar to the lump in the circumparent disk, you can see this uh, lump changes shape be just because the shadow. The shadow, within the shadow, the temperature decreases. Um, so, so it's like if you stand in a shadow from the sun, the temperature decreases. The same happened in the disks, in the outer disk in the shadow, the disk temperature decreases. And this decreasing of the temperature in the shadow can be probed by armor, um, like here. Um, so the armor, the, these disks are optical thick at some millimeter. Um, and then you can see this some millimeter deficit. And this deficit is due to the decrease of the disk temperature within the shadow. Okay. So um, these shadows will also move with time, um, but they are not moving at the same speed as the disk precision. And this is due to a geometry uh, effect. Um, so, so you could work out the relationship between the disk precession and the shadows movement. Um, but overall, uh, over decades or over one decade, the shadows in some of these systems should change and we should be able to detect them with future observations. And we could use this change to also constrain the inner disk uh, geometry. Okay, so this is all I want to say about how to break the disk with a low mass companion. Um, and there are a lot of observations on this. And then um, I'll talk about the, how to break a disk from two, the binaries at the disk center. Um, but before I talk about that, I'll talk about this uh, polar aligned circum binary disk simulations done by my graduate students, uh, Ian uh, Robago. So as Steve um, mentioned yesterday, um, you could have two stable orbits uh, around eccentric binary. Okay, so one stable orbit is that coplanar case. Um, it's precession of, process of all the binary angular momentum uh, vector. Another stable orbit is this polar alignment um, process around the eccentricity uh, vector. And uh, you could try different test particles with different incarnations and eventually map out their eccentricity vector and um, eccentricity and angular momentum vector and produce this phase plot. Uh, you have seen probably some of the um, papers. Uh, and the simulations have been carried out SPH simulations, both are SPH simulations to show that for highly misaligned circumbinary disks around eccentric binaries, they can go to the polar direction. So we know proto, we know these observations, nice observations, but all of these are protoplanary disks. Um, protoplanary disks normally has very low viscosity. So we want to see, okay, whether this thing happened if you have a low viscosity uh, disk. So in this simulation, we have an equal mass binary, uh, eccentricity 0.5. It's 60 degree inclined towards the binary uh, plane. And the setup here, we have to rotate the whole system by 90 degrees. Okay, so this is a different setup normally you use to calculate certain binary disks. The binary is moving up and down in this simulation so that the eccentric, eccentricity vector is pointing upwards. And then the polar disk will persist um, around the eccentricity vector. So they will still be kept in the simulation domain. Some tricks um, needs to be done here. So we explore the parameter space by changing alpha by forward magnitude and see how the disk responds to the changing of the viscosity. So this is uh, from um, an animation made by NASA using the simulation data. So you have an eccentric binary uh, at the center here. Um, they are moving in this XY plane. And we initialize the disk with a 60 degree inclination. Right here, 60 degree inclination. And this is a large alpha um, disk. Uh, so the disk will start to warp, moving to the polar direction at the center. And then this warp will propagate outwards like a diffusion. And eventually the whole disk will be in this polar alignment. So we could watch this movie again. Um, so this is consistent with the SPH simulations, uh, where if you put a large alpha here, then you see the polar alignment of the disk, which happens very quickly, over hundreds of binary orbits. Um, this, this warp will propagate throughout the disks, eventually dissipates, 
Um, yeah, so we polar aligned uh, disks. Um, but if we decrease the viscosity, uh, we see that alignment time scale gets longer and longer. This is consistent with analytical uh, calculations. So this purple curve here is the incarnation for alpha 0.1 disks. So over 400 binary orbits, um, within one precision, it's coplanar. Co but for a smaller viscosity, like 10 to negative three, then we don't see any sign of this um, coplanar um, damping uh, within 1000 orbits. Okay. So eventually they may damp, but when you decrease this viscosity, the time scale for alignment gets longer and longer. And also the gap um, looks different if you decrease the viscosity. When we decrease the viscosity, the gap becomes wider and wider, kind of expected. When you have less viscosity, the gap opened by the binary will be wider. Um, but the real surprise comes from that if you have a really small viscosity, like 10 to negative five, you start to develop a density bump um, at the cavity edge, like here. Um, so this density feature correlates with anticyclonic rotation or vortex uh, in the disk. So you may think this is similar to the lump in the coplanar case, um, but it's actually different. Um, so we start with, so the, the, you, you start to have these uh, two vortices in the disk. Uh, and then these vortices will kind of merge and become one vortex in a very low viscosity disk, 10 to negative five. And this vortex will settle to a distance around 3.57 binary orbits. And we'll have a rotation period, uh, follow the local capillary speed with a rotation period of about 6.7 uh, binary period. Okay. So this is different from this lump in the Copaner case in several ways. The first way, the first is that this lump even formed in alpha equal 0.1 disk. Um, and these lumps are produced by the binary grab material and throw to the gap cavity edge. But for the polar cases, um, these density feature only appears when alpha is extremely low, like 10 to negative five. So this is more similar to this planet disk interaction problem. You introduce a vortex when the alpha is very, very low due to Rossby wave instability. Okay, so, so then, Polar cases is more similar to this, only happening in a very invasive disks. Nevertheless, this capillary rotating vortex uh, may still cause this episodic um, accretion, but now the period is not five orbital period, uh, could be maybe a seven orbital period due to the movement of the pump. Um, but if we compare with observation, we will say, okay, if what you said is true, why we don't see this vortex in this HD systems? Uh, one possibility is that maybe in protoplanet is the viscosity is actually not that low. Um, maybe it's around 10 to negative three, or maybe the vortex dissipates in the past. Um, like in the protoplanetary cases, you see that these vortex will disappear over thousands uh, of orbits. Okay. So we have carried out these uh, polar disk simulations and by varying the alpha, uh, we start to see different physics um, than before like the vortex formation. And then we want to ask, if you have misaligned disks, um, how the misaligned disk um, can break. This is very important because we have seen these uh, disk breaking um, happening um, for these, uh, so there are three rings in this system, right? And uh, different simulations seem to suggest different things. Like uh, some suggest that they can break, the, the triple star in the center can break, some suggest they cannot break, um, and maybe you need a planet here to break. Um, so we want to uh, tag this problem with uh, again with our setup. So in this simulation, um, it's the same simulation as you have seen before, this polar line disks. The only thing we change is H over R. So we decrease H over R slightly from 0.1 to 0.07, and also make the outer disk slightly bigger. So on the left, this is a alpha 0.1 disks, and you can see the disk trying to persist, but stuck with the outer disk and develop a warp, and this warp diffuse outwards, right. so it didn't break. Um, on the right, when alpha is 10 to negative three, then the inner disk start to persist, and then we break free. So it just persists around the eccentricity vector by itself, while the outer disks um, persist at much slower rate. Um, so here, these two disks um, had different response if you change the alpha slightly. So with a bigger alpha, 
you develop this warp and this warp diffuses out. Um, while in a, with a smaller alpha, the disk will break and you generate this wave propagate at half the sound speed. So you could work out the breaking condition to break the sound crossing time across the disk should be larger than precision time scale of the disk. And you could plot of, pull out both time scale in, uh, from our simulation. And you can see that the precision time scale increases towards outer disks. Um, the precision time scale also increases outwards. But when they two cross each other, this is where the disk will break. Right? This is a breaking radius. And whenever the disk break, you reset the precision time scale. So you jump and then the outer disk will process at this rate. And from here, you can see why the precision, or whether the disk break is very, very sensitive to the disk condition. Because both of these curves increases towards the outer disk. You, are re you rely on the relatively slight different slope between these two curves to determine if the disk will break or not. So in this case, the simulation break at the right um, predicted um, position. Uh, and then for this, uh, this GW ORI systems, um, we tried the, our analytic um, setup um, criterion and studied two different setup. And you can see that with one of the setup, you indeed do not expect, um, expect breaking. Um, but for another setup, you could have a breaking and we have run simulation to confirm these. Um, and if you play with the parameters careful enough, um, you could have a scenario where the disk will break into four rings. Uh, you have one crossing, another crossing. I'm not sure whether this will be eventually stand out. Um, we are still running simulations with this setup to see whether it can break really into many, many rings um, like obligation. So uh, finally, one slide on the simulation setup. When we run these uh, highly inclined disks, we start to run into problems that uh, the main problem is we have to cut a hole in a spherical polar grid. Then we cannot capture the mini grid, uh, mini disks. So recently we start to switch to this Cartesian grid with mesh refinement. And we have done tests to show that um, these uh, spherical polar simulation and the Cartesian simulation reach similar numerical errors um, um, if they have similar uh, resolution. So this is some of the new setup uh, we are testing right now. Okay, so. That's end to conclude. Um, in Puerto Plantis, we have seen this breaking happening um, all the time. Um, we have seen shadows, we have seen temperature change in the shadows, we have seen the shadows change with time. And what causes the break? Um, with a companion, you have two ways to break it. The another is a low mass companion to open a gap. So you break the certain primary disk. Another is you use a binary at the center to torque the disk and break it free. But this a mechanism sensitivity depends on the disk condition. Um, the thinner the user to break. So for AGN disks, I heard people talk about HOR 0.01 or 0.001. So in those cases, um, actually, it's probably it's very easy to break a disk. Um, um, that works by Chris Nixon. So for the polar disks, um, the low viscosity cases, like in polar plant disks, can lead to a different phenomenon, like the vortex formation. And this will could make these two different episodic accretion at different periods. So in future, we hope to capture both the mini disks and certain binary disks, and we need to use Cartesian with mesh refinement. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dawa. Questions? I'm gonna. I'll ask while I'm on my way to Dong. So, can you say a little bit more about the vortex formation? Is it is it actually the Rosby wave instability or something else? Because it seems like it doesn't have that characteristic M equals M equals five mode that the yeah. RWI has, but an M equals two. So, so the, the M equals two mode is basically because the binary have these uh, two spirals, um, the very strong M equals two mode uh, dis um, disturbance to the disk. So that's why it's starting with M equals two, but they later merge the same yeah. way as Rossby wave instability. But is it true? I mean, but is, is that edge Rossby wave unstable and that's what's happening? Is that the same yeah, thing? Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Beautiful stuff, so on. So in the first part of your talk, you put the uh, massive planets initially inclined the mm -hmm. disk and yeah. then, right, and you see the evolution opening gap and break. Mm -hmm. uh, the two questions, right? Uh, I, I guess you're, you're, you're set up 
the planet mass is much larger than local disk mass. Yes. Yeah. Right? Is that yeah. a realistic thing? That's the first question. The second question is, uh, what's the current thinking on the initial angle you put in? You put in at 90 degrees, oh, no, 19 degrees, something? Yeah. What's the, where the, that, you know, 19 may be not so big, but what is the current thinking? Where they come from? Right? Oh, where yeah, so are. those are basically uh, numerical. I understand, but yeah. is there a way to think about it? What, what's current thinking? Will, if you put in the, one degree, then that may be okay, but 19 seems to be very big. Uh, yeah, yeah. Real situation. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so we didn't explore the, why we didn't ask the question why it misaligned in the first place. Okay, so that's a simple answer. We don't know why they climb, um, misalign the binary. And if the binary misaligned, then we study what's happened for the disk. And uh, you could see that with different, uh, with different incarnation, um, you could have a different um, like breaking conditions. Um, so this is what we studied. So I cannot answer the question why it's inclined, but the planet needs to be really massive so that it's larger than local disk mass. So the planet will not cope, like align with the disk within the breaking time scale. Then, um, so that's kind of the, the one of the requirements. Also, the disk needs to be very massive. Yeah. Scott. Hi, uh, I'm Scott Noble. Um, the re really cool talk. Thank you. Um, uh, first thing, uh, so we looked at vorticity in the lump. There's no vorticity. So that's probably a big difference. Um, and uh, second, uh, I'd love to talk to you about um, head head comparisons between Cartesian grids and spherical grids, but mm -hmm. that's probably done better offline. And third, um, have you looked at how the, um, when the disc breaks, like what, what's the accretion rate through that breaking region? Yeah. Yeah. So the th third question, we are looking at that, um, right now. It's very hard to actually see where the flow comes in because you would expect is that the nodal position, the flow is coming in, right? It's, that's where it's only connected. Um, so we see something like that. But the issue is that with a binary at the center, it's periodically like perturb the disk. So we really need to do a very long time scale averaging to see where this viscous accretion happening throughout this gap. And you could see that the accretion really happens because this uh, breaking radius is actually changing. It's like uh, gradually increases with time. Um, so you know the mass is actually flowing from the outer disk to the inner disks. Um, yeah. yeah. So some question from online, we go online first. Uh, hi, Yang, unmute yourself. Oh, hi, uh, very, very nice talk. Uh, I have a very simple question. Is this a vortex long-lived or transient feature for several thousand orbits? Oh, yeah, so the vortex exists for um, 2,000 binary orbits. But regarding the local orbital time scale, we have only run the simulation basically for several hundred. So we okay. still need to run much, much longer to see the vortex dissipation, like in the circum, in the planet action problem, people run like for thousands, even more than 1,000, 10,000 orbits to see um, the vortex dissipation. But that require that normally done in 2D, so you can afford that. In 3D, it's, it's almost impossible to run for 10,000 orbits. And you want to, you are, well, you have a binary at the center. So that's a limitation that we cannot study the long term evolution of the vortex uh, in this problem. Oh, that, that's very interesting because I also have some vortex generated uh, when you're changing thermodynamics mm -hmm. in the coplanar cases combining this. Makes sense. Andrew, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, great, great work. Uh, so you showed very nicely how the um, the breaking could be uh, explained by this uh, the time scale comparison of precession to uh, to uh, communication. It one detail. It looked like the gap was actually interior to that. Is that is that an important detail or? Yeah. So so the breaking condition is actually a very crude estimate. Uh, the breaking condition, we basically compare the two time scale. In a lot of cases, it's very hard to really predict where, where they are. So we try different kind of uh, breaking conditions. Um, and this one seems to work well. And also is this, this one, we actually change 
some parameters in this one based on the simulations we could estimate some of the properties of the wave propagation so we with this case exactly we think it's it agrees very well what not agreed well is this one right this one seems to like a differ by a factor of two um but uh, considering how crude these estimates they are um it seems that uh we are happy with the condition we have so far um well we will probably still see if we can refine these ones uh, in future but but as you can see here this breaking really relies on two slopes are very close to each other um so that's why it's kind of very sensitive to a lot of these conditions okay. sure thanks yeah oh thank you for the beautiful talk this is jaru i have a question about one of the images that you show at the very beginning if I remember correctly, um, HD 143006. Yeah, um, this one, yeah, or uh, oh, this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I remember, I think at some point I came across seeing that um, there's a vague uh, M equals to one spiral feature that's being seen across many, the radius of many rings in this image. And, but I remember you said once those gaps are formed when the disk are breaking to two parts, they stop communicating with each other, but does it, so do they consistent with each other? Can you still form like something like continuously spiraling from the inside to the outside of the disk? Oh, you mean the the companion will excite spirals or, uh, um, or the observationally you see spirals? Oh. Yeah, I think there's a paper saying observationally there's a very uh, there's a thin spiral after you remove the axisymmetric mm -hmm. feature. Mm -hmm. um, oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, right. That's uh, Sean Andrews. Uh, uh, do you believe that? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm done that too. So you in that one, the spiral. Uh, there is a spiral um, from somewhere here. Actually, that's the only spiral in the D-sharp sample um, we have seen from some meter, and that spiral is consistent with a companion. Um, in the disk and the spiral is in the right direction. Uh, so because from here, you can see how the disk rotates and you could figure out how the spiral should go this way or that way. And that spiral is a trading spiral. It's consistent with the companion in the disks. And this is also the only disk you could see the CO kinematics, something interesting happening within the gap. Another evidence that there is a companion somewhere. So all of these evidence suggests that there should be a companion um, no mass companion in this disk. And uh, it's kind of the the most massive companion in all the D sharp sample. Um, so in future, people should really look for, I think people are looking for companion in this case. All the evidence, including the spiral, pointing out to there is a companion in the system. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thornton? Yeah, so sorry if I missed this, but for the disk breaking, uh, when you generate the precessing tilted inner disk, how, how uh, I'm trying to understand the role of the inclination of the planet orbit. Uh, I mean, I assume if it's coplanar. No, the you, planet started you would, with. You wouldn't get. Line. I assume if it's coplanar, you wouldn't get it. Yeah, if you just start with the coplanar, you wouldn't get it. Yeah. So, so there must be a condition on the inclination of the planet, not just on the mass. And then how prevalent? Oh. How prevalent is this phenomenon, given both conditions? Yeah. So in the in the condition exactly, I I put here there is no inclination um, inclination uh, in this formula. But in the paper, we have some sign inclination in this condition. So indeed, if your inclination is zero, you won't break the, break the um, disks. Um, so there is a condition regarding uh, the sign of the uh, inclination. Yes, um, the inclination is not a, a monotonic thing because um, while you increase while you increase your inclination, right, it's harder to open a gap because the planet is start to further away from the disk. They have less inter influence to the disk, so the gap gets shallower. And while it start to change your precision rate because uh, it's uh, it's good, it's like higher, it makes it easier to break. So, so the inclination actually plays a role um, uh, in this in this picture, indeed. indeed. Yeah. Satisfied in, is that satisfied in many cases? This, yes, yeah, it is. Kind of like these two cases, and they break. Uh, we try different incarnation, yes. They are consistent with the simulation. For actual planets, 
Oh, for actual planning, we don't, as Dong said, um, ask. We don't know what's the initial, what causes the planet to misalign at the first place. So here we just assume that the planet misaligned magically. <laughs> and uh, um, it, yeah, so could be due to a third body perturbation to misalign the planet at the first place. Um, okay. Hi, uh, Ian Chikala. Um, Two two things. One, um, so Brianna has been working on regularized maximum likelihood imaging techniques, and HD one four three zero zero six has been yeah. our like test case. So um, it might be interesting to chat about those who are interested in sort of spiral features and stuff as a just sort of independent way to analyze the data. Um, but I had a question about uh, what happens if you have another planet or multiple planets in addition to your sort of giant planet in the, yeah. that's, that's doing the breaking, do those planets just stay in the, in the disc in yeah. the, in the separate planes that have been broken? Um, and then, you know, what might be the implication for the, the mutual inclination distribution of, yeah. of exoplanetary systems? Yeah. So if you have a low mass planet at the inner disks, after the disk breaking, the low mass planet will ride on the disk. Um, so we'll change its, um, Incarnation will move with the disk because the 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 like damping time of the planets and the disks um, alignment time scale also depends on the planet mass. So you could come up with a scenario where the inner disks misaligned and the planet will be misaligned too. Um, so they will be mutually inclined eventually. Um, so that's one possibility to generate misaligned planets. But the effect if you put two planets. Uh, but you really need to have one plan to break the disk. You cannot have, say, I have 10 Jupiter mass break a plan, break the disk, then I put two, five Jupiter mass further away. They won't do the same thing because the gap will be shallower. It will be wider, but it will be shallower. That's not enough to break the disk. And those two plans are actually moving at different speed. Um, so it will change the precision time scale too. Yeah. Adam? Yeah. Thanks for the great talk, Jeff. Uh, Jawan is Adam Dempsey. Uh, so I just had a question, maybe a thought. Um, so when I first saw the disk breaking from a gap opening planet, I immediately thought of sort of the history of gap opening planet studies in that, you know, in the, in the past, people thought that the gap completely shut off communication between the outer disk and the inner disk. But then more recent studies found that was a transient phenomenon. And if you wait, you know, a viscous time, the outer disk and the inner disk become connected again, and there's m dot in the outer disk, is m dot in the, through the gap, is m dot in the inner disk. So I wonder if the same thing could be happening here yeah. with the disk breaking, and maybe the disk breaking itself is a transient phenomenon. If you wait long enough, which I'm sure is almost impossible to, si to simulate in 3D for many viscous times, yeah. but if you could, would the communication, or would, would the disk become unbroken, and then maybe they realign themselves or something like that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So you see here, the breaking condition here actually relate with the gap depth. Um, so it's not like gap opening happens and then you break. It needs to be deep enough to cut the communication between in and out. And uh, as, as you said, the breaking is kind of an inversible thing. As long as you start to break, then the gap will start to get deeper. You kind of stop the communication fully. The equation won't go, be able to move through as coplanar case. And then in most cases, it's not reversible. It's not like I run long enough, they will stuck again. As long as you start to break, then they will start to persist by itself, gap get deeper, and, and it will not go back to a um, stuck um, scenario. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of depends on initial condition, how we set it up. It's a little bit uh, intricate. Last question. Yeah, uh, Barry McCronin. Um, it would be really interesting in the spirit of building bridges to other areas to apply this to a IMBH embedded in an AGN disk. And, you know, maybe there are, you know, firstly, it would be interesting to simulate and, and in, in direct AGN disks, but also to search for misalignments in AGN. So if the inner disk is you know, relatively aligned or warped, it may be that there's a disc breaking effect going on due to a, a gap opening IMBH, and that might be detectable with LISA or something like that. So there's there's some really interesting bridge building to be done into into other areas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.